Hello and welcome to Sensei Podcast. This is Manos Brilakis discussing with leaders in the field of CTO and Complex PCI. Sensei means teacher or master in Japanese. The goal of the Sensei Podcast is to help you learn and improve in CTO and Complex PCI so that you can become the best that you can be and offer your patients the best possible results. Okay, hello everyone and welcome to Sensei Podcast. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Arun Kadelen-Sudaram from uh, India, who actually trained in the US and then he has been making a huge impact uh, in uh, India and uh, Asia Pacific. He is the director of CTO interventions at ProMed Hospital in Chennai. He's one of the directors of the CHIP CTO meeting in India and also the India director for the Asia Pacific CTO Club. So he's really made a big impact in CTO and Complex PCI in Asia. Thanks again, Arun, and we're excited that you are joining us today. Uh, of course, uh, Dr. Manos, thank you so much for having me uh, in, you know, as part of this um, web series. Uh, it's truly really an honor and a privilege. I really appreciate the opportunity to be, to be here. So thank you again. No, thank you. Thanks, Arun. And again, we've been working together for many, many years. And I know you've done a phenomenal work, but I always like to ask people how it all started. What was your um, incentive, so to speak, to become a CTO and complex operator? Um, okay. So I guess there are uh, two people that I, I feel are kind of instrumental in having kind of just put me in this direction. One was Dr. Patrick Fitlow when I trained at uh, the Cleveland Clinic. Um, he was, I mean, you know, uh, just an amazing person. Um, I really enjoyed working with him. And when I, when I left the clinic, in fact, my parting words to him were, I don't really know if I like CTO PCI, but I really, really enjoyed working with you. And, and uh, yeah, and, and, and I think so. He was just awesome to work with and just, just great all around. And uh, so when he heard I was moving to Seattle, his, he was like, you should meet this guy, Bill Lombardi, who is up in Bellingham and, you know, um, yeah. And, 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 and then once I went up to Seattle, I went um, to Bellingham to meet Bill, who I had not met before. And uh, so he was like, oh, you're Pat's fellow. I got to take care of you. It was really like, I, I actually remember those, those were his first, uh, the words that came out of his mouth. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, you know, that's really what kind of got me into it from a, um, you know, from a, I would say the, the, the science part of it was that, um, you know, CAD has always been like the reason why I got into cardiology. And, uh, you know, I, I think my first retrograde that I back scrubbed was that actually with Dr. Ochiai again during training. And it was just, you know, one of those things that changes your world. I'm like, what do you mean? The wire goes like this and goes like, oh, wow, I actually have a lasso around the heart. This is so cool. And I was like, okay, I got to get good at this. And um, yeah, so I mean, it, I think that that was kind of love at first sight. Although initially I wasn't willing to give up anything. I wanted to be like, you know, awesome in CTOs and like, you know, be great in structural and be like phenomenal in, in, in peripheral and everything. And um, yeah, and but then like, you know, it was one of those things where I continued to do peripheral uh, CTOs, especially for um, several years I mean, while I was in the US. And uh, of course, coronary CTOs and complex work that goes with that. Um, but I think by the end of my first year after training, and and you know, it was one of those mindset things where I'm like, okay. And, and you know, Bill and I used to talk a lot, and he was like, look, no one's going to be great in everything. You got to pick and choose, man. By choosing something, you're going to have to give up something. And, and it made sense. I mean, you can't, you know. I, I, I mean, I, I guess I could kind of see that. So with a very heavy heart, I kind of said, all right, I'm not going to do structural. Um, and so I think after the first year, I, I stopped doing it. And I was no looking back. I really uh, enjoy CTOs. And you know, it's just the whole the philosophy of it and everything that goes with that. So, you know, obviously, Dr. Whitlow was the PI of fast CTOs, one of the early pioneers of CTO intervention. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but he really inspired many people, including yourself and actually myself as well. And then obviously, Bill Lombardi has been the father of the CTO PCI in North America and elsewhere. And so you were very privileged to work with some of the like foremost people, the, one of the founders, essentially, of the CTO movement in the U.S. Um, how did you, how was it learning? Was it just doing and learning? Was it watching? What, how did you learn the best? Um, honestly, this was in the era where, I mean, we, we, we had some resources, but like, you know, 
um, initially, at least like most of the live case, uh, live cases where um, there was a con, uh, the bill still used to conduct like some, you know, con meetings where we had live cases. So anytime he had that, I would obviously go up there. Um, but it was a lot of learning and, and uh, you know, I would go up, to, I, I got privileges in Bellingham, uh, which is where he used to be at that time. And so anytime I had a case um, or sometimes even when I didn't have a case, I could just, I would just take a day off when uh, Bill had like CTO days and every opportunity that I got, I used to just go up there and because I had privileges, I could scrub in. Um, and it was like, you know, um, it was like a post fellowship fellowship, obviously. Um, and, and um, you know, it was just, so just, you know, scrubbing with Bill and like sometimes he'd sit in the back and be like, all right, you got to do this, this, this. Um, so it was, it was just, I mean, it literally was like, you know, having a fellowship post fellowship and just working really closely with him. Um, so my initial several, several, several cases were all with Bill Lombardi. And then, um, and then of course, you know, I think very early on, he said, all right, you can back scrub. Um, I, th I think I still remember, I think it was Mike Wyman that I, um, so, I mean, he was like the first offer, but it's just great to see another, uh, you know, superstar work. And I'm like, oh yeah, this is really cool. And I mean, Mike obviously is a very different personality, but like, that's how I learned. I mean, you know, just, uh, uh Tony, um, was there and I think, um, Craig Thompson had come there and I mean, Dimitri had come to, uh, to, uh, for one of the courses and I mean, you know, just watching them, just the ability to, you know, sometimes scrub with these guys on, you know, on being in front of camera and learning all this stuff. It was just, it was, uh, it was a great experience. It was just, I mean, I think that's how I picked it up initially. And um, yeah, and the other thing was by doing them, right? Um, and, and he, you know, Bill was, a, was like, you know, because it's one of those mindset things. I'm like, why would I do a CTO when I have one of the world's best, like two hours away? Does it, is that in the patient's best interest? Should I even be doing it? And in fact, honestly, his answer was very honest and very encouraging. He said, look, I don't have time to do all the CTOs. Uh, I do this, this, this. So you're in Seattle and you know, if you want to do, if this is what you want to do, uh, go ahead and do them. If you think it's super unsafe or you have tried and failed, then bring them over here, but you should do them. And I think that was very encouraging because you know, early on, obviously we don't want to hurt patients and we don't want to like, you know, uh, do something that's totally out of a wheelhouse. So I think that was very, very good. Not him not being there was, I would say, actually also very good because it's not like I could just be like, oops, I can't do this. I'm like, can I have you come and finish the case for me? So sometimes, you know, you're just there and you got to, um, you know, just take care of the patient. And uh, I was the go-to uh, PCI guy in my hospital um, at Thailand, which was like a smaller hospital down in Seattle. But I used to do like the CTOs at uh, Swedish. So it was kind of, it was, it was like a really good mix. I had, you know, right time, right place, right mentors. That's how the whole journey started. And what was the hardest thing for you to learn in terms of the techniques, the algorithms? What did, was it the wires? I mean, what was the thing that you found the hardest to, to master? Oh, I, I think for me, um, honestly, more than the technical aspects, it was a, it was a mindset thing. Like um, I, you know, and, and I think all of us are wired differently, right? I mean, we all share certain common traits, which is like, hey, you know, I think most of us are hardworking. We want to do this. We want to be really good at our job, et cetera, et cetera. But like, you know, m truthfully, my biggest challenge was probably was like, I was seeing Bill all the time and I'm like, I suck. I'm like, you know, my yardstick was like, uh, it's like, you know, I, I still remember like, you know, i one of the cases very early on, I don't remember it was the first or the second or the third case or whatever. And, and, you know, I was trying to wire the septal and I was like, you know, out of fellowship. I initially, I was like, you know, on a high and very confident and everything. And I couldn't wire it for like, and then of course it's like two minutes later, Bill takes the wire and, you know, maybe 10 seconds or 15 seconds later, he was in the RCA and uh, he still let me do the, you know, uh, uh, so, but, but it, it took me a long time to understand that, okay, I, I need to get really, good at this and it's it's there's going to be a big learning curve here right like you're not going to just get good at it because you're good at ct you know pci or whatever uh once again i mean you know it was you know one of those things where um, i had to accept this you know i knew it in my brain but i think my heart you know i had to accept that it's going to take some some time before you get you know you get good at this stuff because there is a lot of learning um and you know i still remember his his quote was like uh, how many PCIs have you done? 
And I'm like, well, you know, it was just out of fellowship. I think two months. I was like, oh, 600, whatever. I don't remember the number. Then I said something. And it's like, dude, I've done like 1,500 CTO PCR. I should be better at you than this. I mean, so why don't you do the number? And then you will know how good you are. So that was, I think, once again, I'm like, okay, it is a process. I got to do more, right? You have to, um, I think that accepting that, um, you know, you're not really good at something, but you're still going through the learning process after your fellowship, I think took me a while to kind of, I mean, I kind of knew it, but to actually operationalize it took me, took me a while. And then how do you prepare now for the CTOs? Have things changed? Do you do something different than what you were doing five, 10 years ago? Um, so uh, yes and no. I mean, some things haven't changed. I still, I mean, I, I, I think it's always good to over prepare. So anytime, like, I mean, it's, you know, when, when you, when I get a case, I, I, I do like, I, I think most of us are like that. I mean, I think we like looking at angiograms, just like people like looking at cartoons. I like looking at, you know, angiograms. And uh, so I, I do look at it a lot. I think the preparation and just kind of having a mental plan. Um, I mean, I think you really are the master of like, Hey, this is the algorithm, right? I mean, you, the, the whole hybrid algorithm that came up first is like, it, it, I think it kind of demystified some of these things, right? I mean, it's not like you just go in and start wiring and keep wiring and keep wiring. You say, okay, here's my plan A, my plan B, my plan C, my plan D. So those things haven't changed. I still think, you know, I look at angiograms a lot. I look at, um, you know, have a really good plan, make sure if things go down south, what are my bailout options? What do I have? You know, especially with proctoring, when you go to like other hospitals, you really need to have your act together and make sure you, everything is there because sometimes you end up going to places where we don't get everything that we get in the U.S. So I think over preparation still happens. Um, now, what has changed, I would say, is the fact that uh, at this point, you know, there used to be a time, and this was, again, one of those philosophical things that I struggled with a lot. I always was scared that what if I mess up because I'm not good enough? What if the patient gets hurt because I'm just not good enough? And what if someone else sort of saved the day? So these days, I, I'm like, look, I've been through the process. I have the numbers behind me. I do think about all of this stuff. And if I fail, I fail. I mean, it's okay. I think that part is that I don't really care about I have to succeed anymore. I just have to be like, all right, I'm going to do my best. I go with the plan. You don't, I mean, you still do all the homework, but I really don't care about the result anymore. I mean, I do, like from a patient standpoint, I do, but it's not like, uh, oh, I'm going to look bad if I fail or I can't fail. I don't put that kind of pressure on myself at all. Like, I mean, that I think is, that's gone. And so do you get stressed at all these days or are you feeling fairly relaxed when you do those cases? Uh, I mean, anytime, like even although I don't care about success or failure, I think doing CTO PCI is always stressful, right? I mean, there is a, it's a, it's a good kind of stress. Um, I know it's one of those quotes. I don't know. I don't think I came up with that. But if you want to do CTO PCI, you have to be comfortable being uncomfortable. And anytime you're uncomfortable, there's always stress, right? Like, you know, it's outside... Because, you know, anytime, let's say you're doing something, you're, you're knuckling and you just hope, okay, I hope the knuckle takes the right shape. It doesn't explode. So there's always this thing in the back of your mind. Um, so there's, I think there's a degree of stress. Um, hopefully it's healthy stress. Um, but yeah, it's there. It's, it's still there. I don't think it ever goes away. <laughs> Perfect. And then... Um... How do you deal with complications? You know, CTO and complex complications will happen. How do you deal with them? Uh, okay. So one, I think it's part of the preparation part, right? I mean, I think, you know, just, I mean, even early on when we had ctofundamentals.org and all of this stuff, I think sharing cases was very, very, very helpful because you don't have to make every mistake yourself, right? Uh, and I think within the CTO community, I think, you know, one of the things I love about it is, one, it's very welcoming. And number two, everyone wants to help everyone. And be, you know, we've all had complications. We know that. I think, you know, sharing stuff, I think, was very helpful. So early on, I think the knowledge component, it's like, I mean, I'd never embolized anything before. I didn't know how to harvest fat and, like, inject stuff or you know, that kind of stuff. I think just, you know, watching other people, practicing it, et cetera, you know, outside. Those things are all very helpful because otherwise you take fat and you don't know which way it's going to go. You, I mean, there's a technique to all of these stuff and you don't want to do it in the middle of a case. 
So I think that was, so the complication part, I think was, you know, sharing cases was super helpful. Number two, I think I am a, you know, I'm, I am, you know, I, I don't want to say I'm super cautious. I mean, there's a very fine line between, I think, being heroic and being reckless. Uh, in my mind, I always want to play very strong on the defense, uh, meaning like if there's a way I can avoid a complication and still lose my, let us say um, you want to get 99% success in CT or PCI, your complication rate, I think, you know, take the same operator. I think the complication rate is going to go up if you're not cherry picking your cases. Now, me personally, this is a philosophical thing. I would rather take a lower complication rate at the, you know, at the cost of, having slightly lower success. And I'm okay with that um, because, you know, I can always live to fight another day is what I tell myself. I was like, I mean, not that we don't, you know, we're not aggressive in terms of what we do, but I think it's, it's a balance. Uh, so I do my darnest to try and avoid complications in the first place. Um, and then of course, like, you know, making sure everything is there. That's the, the, the whole checklist kind of thing, right? Um, you know, making sure, especially in other labs, because your lab, you know, I mean, you, you, you know, let's say you have a, um, let's say patient goes into tamponade, you know who to call, you know, which tech is good, you know, you know, you know everything like the back of your hand. So all that matters is getting the needle into the pericardium. And I think perforations are the biggest complication that we always worry about. So, um, you know, when, when you go to another lab, make sure that they have covered stents. What do they have? Is it on the shelf? Do they know where it is? Where is the, you know, uh, is, how long will it take for us to get an echo? Uh, you know, just just asking all these questions up front and being prepared, I think, is really how I, um, you know, think about complications. And of course, nobody likes it. I mean, you know, and after every complication, um, you know, I do think about it. I'm like, okay, could I have done something better? Um, I still like, you know, talk to friends and say, like, okay, this is what I did, blah blah blah. I think doing kind of a postmortem analysis and saying, could I have done something better? Uh, or avoided something? Was it a reckless maneuver? So, I mean, I do kind of mentally kind of agonize about everything. And we, I think most of us do, right? I mean, you have a bad outcome. We all think about it for days, I think, before we are able to move on. And then are there any cases that have stuck with you over the years that you learned a lot from? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think all those cases that we fail, like we, I mean, for me, it's like, you know, those have all been extremely educational um, because I don't think anyone actually likes failing, right? None of us like to fail. I mean, we'd say it's okay, success or failure, but nobody likes to fail. So I think, you know, if you don't get something, I'm like, what did I, what could I have done different? Did I not manage my radiation properly? My, my, you know, my, why did I have to stop the case, right? We think about that. The, I would say the thing that I really, uh, one case that I remember was when, you know, there was a, um, you know, it was an epicardial, I wired it. I, you know, but there was a big, uh, um, you know, patient ended up having tamponade. Was a, I mean, it was like a big perf and all this stuff. And then, you know, I don't think, you know, I went back, looked at it, but it was one of those things where, um, you know, after that, I had a lot of people like, you know, we had a, um, um, you know, anytime there's any untoward outcome, people talk about like, okay, um, there's going to be a mortality committee or an m and and all this stuff. And people are asking questions. And, you know, it's like, it's one of those things where you realize that it's like, okay, number one, I'm so glad we have a community because, you know, right after the case, we went through the whole thing and I'm like, okay, what could I have done different? This, 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 uh, should I have not have taken it? Did, you know, did I use the right kind of wire, et cetera. But then you also realize that, hey, I got to respect the environment in which I work immensely. Um, and if you are the only guy that's doing quote unquote crazy stuff, um, then you better watch your back and you just have to, I think it's, it's super important uh, because I think that that case taught me something. It's like, okay, because I can, doesn't mean I should. Uh, I mean, the indication was very good. It, it's not like, I know I was second guessing on the, I mean, appropriateness was good. All of that was good. It was just that you still have to watch and see um, just, you know, the whole environment, like, you know, make sure you, um, you know, talk and get, get buy-in. And, and this is especially true when you travel across different geographies because people have very different mindsets. I mean, you go to a hospital where you knuckle for the first time, they're going to look at you like, I mean, what are you doing? I mean, this is unsafe. And like, so I think upfront preparing people, um, I mean, it's easier when you go as a proctor many times because people expect that, hey, this is going to be a, um, you know, he's here because he's the expert. But even then, I just make sure I'm going to say, hey, I'm going to do these things. I'm going to, let's say you do a Carlino, right? I just tell them it's going to look really ugly because this is what we're going to do. 
but it's okay because you know been there done that this is the rationale it's a i think these days it's a little bit more demystified because the strength in numbers you're no longer like the sole guy that's doing something crazy it's like you know there are guidelines i mean we have an algorithm i think that that really helped having um you know just saying these are some of the steps and i think you are um uh, you know a lot of the stuff that you put on youtube where it's like you get stuck here you do this 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 so when you are talking about these steps even if they haven't done it i think there's more acceptance now speaking of uh, proctoring that you mentioned and i know that you've done this in many places both in the us and uh, abroad as well in india and other places um when you work with someone what are the things that you look for like in the people you are training uh so i i mean first uh, i mean if you're talking about who uh, i mean i proctor whoever asks me to so i mean i'm not very picky in terms of like okay i think he's going to be a great cd operator hence a proctor no i feel like i shouldn't be the i mean they've asked for a proctor because they're interested in doing it hopefully so you go there uh across different geographies i mean i was i mean you know i spent the proctoring year before i actually moved back to india i think that was one of the most phenomenal experiences i have had it uh, i mean i've had and i'm you know so thankful to however you know the world worked out and to my wife for having put up with me for that year um especially with her having just been to india but a uh, couple of things sometimes you realize that you know the person you're going to proctor and this is i, I would say probably not very true in the us but sometimes you just go to a place because as a proctor because they just want the cases done uh, and that's very obvious if someone invites dr brilakis and then he is like hey i'm like super busy today thank you so much for coming blah 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 but i have a really busy clinic today so can we just just work with my whoever and get it done it tells you very quickly that they have they just want the cases done and i'm like that's actually easy because then i'm just doing the cases um but but most a lot of them i, I would say are interested in ctos and hence they call you um so i think the biggest the, you know whether someone's going to be good at ctos or not is i mean two things right one is you got to really be humble because i think most of the people that you're working with are they're superstars in their own right they're experienced interventionists who generally succeed in most of the cases that they take so um i mean one of the things is to learn you have to unlearn right i mean you know you have to like let go of some of these things and say it's okay i mean i'm you know i'm going to do these things which i've not done before so i think willingness to learn is super important and i think the other um thing is like i mean of course you have to work hard and in this i'm talking about the younger lot etc i think most of us yeah you have to work really hard if you want to be good at ctos because honestly it's one of the hardest things that you know we do in interventional cardiology and arun how do you able to keep your balance because obviously you have a very busy clinical program i know you do some research you present at different meetings how do you keep how do you keep it all running Oh man, do I you should exercise the you really I should ask you, you that. You are the man. I have so much respect for you guys. So I mean, frankly, I think one is um I I I don't think I've always done a good job at it. Um there are times when I did like absolutely no research. I did I wrote nothing and I was just so busy to just I just wanted to do more cases. I was just hungry for like okay, I really want to like do more stuff, right? Um and then like you know some other times I'm like man I really like what happened to that Arun the one that actually wanted to write etc so um you know it's it's hard um it does but again every time we choose to do something it does also mean that you're not doing a lot of other things so you know the the I think the bigger balance thing is not even between academic work and 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 clinical work or proctoring but it's also the whole work life balance um that honestly I would say in Asian countries it's not it's not as clearly defined right i mean i work now 6 days actually probably 7 days a week including sundays because if that's the case i just go and do it um so it's like you know it's striving to find that i think is super hard i think you know talking to your partner and saying hey i'm going to do all this these things are you okay with that so getting buy in from your significant other or your partner i think is super important um and and uh, yeah but and there's also times when i'm I'm still at the phase where I really enjoy doing CTOs and I can't believe oh they actually pay you for doing stuff that you really like okay that's great that's a bonus and you're helping people it's like hey it's a win 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 all all the way around so that's great I still really really enjoy doing it but um uh, sometimes you know it's not all fun and games and I'm like okay I still have to be dad I still have to be husband I still have to do all this stuff so I think it's a balancing act and the other thing is you also have to be healthy 
because I think all of what we want to do is contingent uh, uh, upon us being like, you know, in good physical shape and doing this. So I do try and um, despite the travel, despite everything, I eat pretty healthy. And, and uh, I mean, I was just said, tell myself I'm South Asian. I can't afford to eat unhealthy if I want to stick around and do stuff. Um, and I also try and, you know, just get in some physical activity most days of the week. And then do you have a favorite book or a favorite movie? Uh, okay. I really like the Lord of the Rings books. So I, I'm like, so I'm a big, uh, you know, talking fan. So I really liked it. Um, I, so in nonfiction, I mean, I, I, I like a lot of like, um, I, I, mean, I like Isaac Asimov. I like a lot of like the, uh, yeah, the theoretical physics kind of stuff. That's kind of the nerdy part. Um, I also really liked something which I didn't think I would like, which is um, Guns, Jumps and Steel, which is a book by I think, Jared Diamond. It just really made, it's one of those books that really made me think about, I mean, I was like, I, I didn't know much about anthropology and this and that, but it was one of those things that forces you to think very, very differently about why are you where you are and why am I where I am? Like, you know, it's one of those questions. And it was a very interesting take on the whole, how civilizations change over millennia, et cetera. So it's an interesting book. Um, movies, I like a lot of movies. I'm a movie buff. Um, I like, I think, I mean, I like Matrix. It was a cool, really cool movie because it's it's so layered. You could watch it purely for the you know special effects and all the you know, dodging bullets. It also was a very philosophical movie if you think about it because it's like, how do we know what is real, what is not, blah, blah, blah. So I think it was a very layered movie. I liked it. I like Kung Fu Panda uh, because I think it teaches a lot of life lessons. I think there's a lot of Zen lessons in Kung Fu Panda and um, you could... You know, it, what, and I think one of one of the quotes in the movie really applies to CTOs. Uh, and I think I probably should say that to like, you know, colleagues or ju- junior colleagues that are watching it, because I'll tell you, one of my big challenges was always like, like I said, I was measuring up to someone else, right? Like, you know, I, I love Bill like a brother, but I'm like, I know I'm never going to be Bill Lombardi. I mean, like I'm going to be Arun Kalyan Chudra. But it, in a Kung Fu Panda, there's a quote where he says like, don't be me, be you, be the best you you can be. And I think that was just brilliant because, you know, I can never be Manos. I can never be Bill. I can never be anyone else. I have to find my own identity and figure out what am I comfortable with? Am I like, you know, am I getting better? Am I doing this stuff? So I think from a, yeah, I'm sorry, I'm digressing, but the movie was great because it's, it's funny, oh, but it's also perfect. teaching you life lessons. Perfect. Well, I think maybe it should become mandatory viewing for the, you know, budding city operators. So this is perfect. And Arun, what are you most proud of so far? Uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it was one of those things where I—that's uh, a tough one. Um, I'm, I'm actually proud professional. of the fact that I made, um, you know, I made a decision to come back to India because that was very hard. Um, it was a very difficult decision, um, but it, again, a lot of uh, reasons, and I don't want to get into everything, but like. Um, it was one of those things where, you know, I started uh, and I, I really came in without a plan. So, I mean, it was like, it was kind of, um, we, it took a couple of months before the whole proctoring thing got sorted out and everything. And I'm like, why am I leaving Bellevue and all this good stuff? And, you know, it was like super hard in terms of uh, a decision because, but then it was like, uh, in retrospect, it all worked out. I mean, you know, um, it, India has been great. Um, I think also... I think I've, more than being proud, I think I should be thankful to a lot of people, right? I mean, I think it's about being grateful, like having had the right opportunities. It actually forced me to think about, oh my God, there's so much talent out there. Um, and, and you know, just having had the opportunity to work, you know, people think when you're a proctor, it's a one-way thing, but like, gosh, no. I mean, I, I've, <laughs> I've gone to like so many centers and like high volume centers in China and Korea and, and like, there are some guys in India and Malaysia, Singapore. These are guys that have sometimes, I mean, maybe not in Singapore, but like, you know, in some other countries where they have limited resources and, and you figure out how are they able to do so much? And, you know, you, I'm learning from these guys. I'm like, oh, that's a really cool thing. And I haven't seen that before. And they have, there's so much volume. And it's like, you know, um, so I think it's for me, it was like, I guess I'm really not proud. I'm so thankful for having had the opportunity to have like, you know, just work with so many doctors and like such phenomenally gifted operators. And I also feel lucky 
that you know i got my us visa when i was a kid i you know i went to the us i got trained in like you know with like some of the best guys that on planet earth and um you know so i'm 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 really thankful for that more than being proud of that because it's not really my achievement i was just lucky that probably the like 10 guys that have better eye hand coordination or you know just the cerebral acumen to like deal with stuff but hey i got picked so i'm i'm i feel lucky <laughs> Well, I mean, you know, luck favors, favors a prepared mind, right? I mean, obviously, you did a lot of things. Things don't happen by themselves. But, I mean, clearly, you've made an impact. And as you said, the decision to return really can impact many operators and patients in parts of the world with not necessarily all the resources for doing these procedures. So, as of now, what is the most exciting thing for you? What gets you out of bed every morning? Uh, wow, okay. I, I still, I mean, several things. I, you know... I'm a kind of a greedy guy. I like a lot of things in life, Manos. Like I, um, I like CTOs a lot. So when I have a good case, it's like, okay, good. I'm going to do this today. Uh, so that'll be kind of fun. Or, you know, it's like, a, so uh, last week, actually, I was in Wisconsin, like doing my CTO week. And so it was like actually really fun, like, because it was like, all I had to do was CTO. So it was just really good. So that, that still gets me very excited. But also, um, you know, now watching my kids grow up, it's, it's kind of really nice. Like, you know, I'm like, you know, I actually do, I think I'm, you know, I I never used to like relish those things, right? You know, actually taking time to like, okay, this is good. I mean, I come to you with your homework, and I said that part is actually exciting. The other big thing is like I, you know, this the hospital, you know, is, is be. I learned a lot of business stuff over the last two three years. Um, you know, I had no idea what uh, you know EBITDA was or uh, you know ROI. How do you plot this stuff? So I haven't done an MBA, but it's it's like it's a trial by fire. So you learn a lot of like uh, that part is exciting uh, because I think at some point, right? I mean, right now I feel really good about CTOs, um, but I think you know one of the things that I see often is uh, you know it's, I think that's a quote from like the Joker or something. You live long enough, you're gonna you know the hero becomes a villain or something like that, right? So I should, you know, and I was lucky to have had all these mentors. Now it's, it's like, you know, even now, like, you know, I'm at a proctor of the conferences. It's about give back. Like, how do, you, how do you train more people? So that part is exciting. So when we are, like, conducting a course, uh, when you see people that really want to learn, that's super exciting. Um, you know, and, and also in the, these parts, of, like in India, I would say, um, there's a huge, huge need for well-trained interventionalists and also for, you know, patients that, that, that actually trust the doctors because there's, you know, sometimes I've noticed, and again, don't, you know, I don't want this to be taken out of context, but I think the trust, the trust deficit sometimes, you know, for a variety of reasons is probably more prevalent here. So part of, you know, my whole thing has been like, okay, CTOs are tip of the iceberg. When a patient goes to a hospital, he or she should believe that the doctor is truly going to do the best thing for that person. Um, keeping costs in mind, of course, but it always has to be about the patient. So, you know, now I'm, you know, I'm also learning about like, how do we set up businesses? It's, so there's just a lot going on. Um, and, and, uh, you know, the, the teaching part is exciting. CTOs are still exciting. Kids are exciting. So yeah, lots of stuff to look forward to. So lots of exciting things down the line. And then what are your plans for the future? Do you have, uh, do you plan to be doing CTOs forever? Do you have any plans to transition to something else? Obviously, you're obviously quite young right now, and that's maybe not what's on the top of your head, but do you ever think about that? Uh, actually, honestly, I really do. I think, you know, even when I talked about the, you know, just, just recently when I was mentioning about that. So, no, I do not want to do CTOs long term. And in fact, you know, in, even in the live cases part, et cetera. So now it's fun because it's like, it's, it's great. Okay, one more live case. I'm going to do it here, there, et cetera. But uh, one of the things that I like personally want to do is like, you know, be a good mentor, like, you know, people. So I have some junior colleagues that work with me now. And, and, you know, my goal is when I get an opportunity to do like do live cases and when they're ready, right. I mean, they have to kind of, but like, hopefully even in the next two, three years, um, I'm going to be like, okay, I'm actually not going to do this case. I'm just going to sit back and let, he's been with me for three years. He's going to do it because I think, you know, that is a very uh, I mean, I think it's a par I mean, we know that Dr. X can do whatever complex work being there, done that. I mean, it's super nice to see someone on, um, you know, on camera and see them like, oh yeah, that's great. But I know that they can do it. So at this point, like, it's got to be like, okay, now 
hey, someone, it's a teachable skill set, right? Really, that's what it's all about. Um, so I think I want to transition into that role quickly. Um, and I also, like I kind of alluded to last time, I'm like, I also want to create systems where we have good health. I mean, like patients should get good care, not just, I mean, not just CTOs. It's about good cardiovascular care, um, good overall care um, in their best interest. That's reasonably cost effective. So that's a lot. I mean, I'm, I'm still out. I, I mean, I'm obviously not an expert in that part, but I'm learning Um and that's where I want to transition into. It's like you want to create health. I mean, so I would say maybe an entrepreneur is really what I'm looking at down the line. Um, uh, yeah, but I don't still feel like saying I want to give up CTOs, but I think I will at some point because you don't want to be the player. You want to be the guy that's, you know, the coach or like, you know, the guy that's running the team and, like, you know, your team, let them do the job. You can't always be the player. And then I don't... You've done all these things. You've learned from so many people, taught so many people. If you had to summarize in a few pieces of advice, what would you advise people to do if they want to become good and solid and uh, complex and city operators? Work hard. Be humble. Uh, oh, and, and it's okay. F- find a community. Like, you know, make sure you have you know, if you're working in a group practice or whatever, you know, find partners or if you're in like, you know, in another country, like where I am in, just make sure your people like, you know, you have, you need to have that support system. I think that's super important. Um, and uh, I think, you know, the, the, the fourth and the most important thing that I struggled with a lot during my early on times, and I think a lot of us do, um, is, you know, be kind to yourself. It's okay. Like, you know, do your homework, do this, work hard, you know, be humble, blah, blah, blah. But you know, bad things will still happen, you know, once in a while, like, you know, that's just, just make sure your indication is good. I mean, obviously all of that is true, but like, it's okay to forgive yourself if something didn't, I mean, sometimes it's totally out of your control and, you know, the patient might have a big bleed, but it's like, and, and I think we all do the postpartum analysis, but let go. It's okay. I mean, you have, you know, and that's when it, I think it helps to call and talk to a friend and I'm like, Hey, this is what happened because we all have rough days. Like, you know, as much as we, hate to admit we so yeah be kind to yourself that's okay it's okay perfect well Arun again really appreciate you taking the time to talk to us today lots of um, lessons and um, pearls of wisdom that for many people to uh, help them in their journey to become uh, great operators thank you so much and very excited to continue working with you on multiple fronts Um, Manos thank you again for having me over and I mean I I think at some point you should do a question and Q&A with yourself because, I mean, there's so much of knowledge that you need to share. So, by the way, thank you for doing this. I think it's really helpful for a lot of people. Um, and I will see you next week in New York. Thank you again. Wonderful. Thanks again. Thanks, yeah, Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to the Sensei Podcast. 